Hello, my name is Jackie Kay and I'm Chancellor of the University of Salford and also the Scottish Macker or the National Poet of Scotland. For years I've been coming to Manchester Literature Festival and I really admire the whole festival. I admire its ethos, I admire the way that you support activists and political thinkers as well as writers writers known and less well known. I admire the way that you support writers in translation. I admire your Manchester sermon. I think the events have a great buzz and energy to them and I've been at so many over the years. I've loved doing events myself, often with my dear friend Ali Smith. They've been fantastic events. I've also loved attending events like the Manchester sermon, which have given me food for thought for, for a very, very long time. Well, it's upsetting to me that you're in danger now and I would really love anybody who supports you and literature, new writing and writers around the world to dig a wee bit into your pocket and pay the price of a drink or the price of a theatre ticket or anything that you could actually afford and go on the website www.manchesterliteraturefestival.co.uk. Cheers. Uh, in the next hour, we will celebrate the work and debut collections of Nina Mingya Pals, uh, Will Harris, and Romelin Anti. I'm Becky Swain, Director of Manchester Poetry Library at Manchester Metropolitan University. And this event is presented uh, by Manchester Literature Festival and Manchester Poetry Library in partnership with the Centre for New Writing. Uh, welcome to everybody watching on Crowdcast. We have a, an incredible afternoon for you. Um, we had hoped obviously to meet in person at the Manchester Poetry Library on Oxford Road, but COVID had other plans for us. Um, so here we are together on a virtual poetry ley line of our own. Uh, we want to thank our guests for their generosity uh, in sharing their poetry with us this afternoon uh, from their respective homes. Um, and there is an intimacy in that fact uh, that seems fitting for this reading. Um, so Nina will be reading first, um, followed by Will Harris and Romelin and Anti, uh, with time for questions after each reading. Uh, for those of you uh, watching live, if you want to post a question, please do so. Um, and we'll tr try and weave in as many as we can uh, as we go. Um, and hello to uh, Nina and Will and Romelin. Uh, this afternoon uh, and welcome. So our first reader uh, is Nina Mingya Pals, a poet and publisher from Aotearoa in New Zealand, currently living in London. She's the author of a food memoir, Tiny Moons, A Year of Eating in Shanghai, published by Emma Press, and several poetry pamphlets, including Luminescence and Girls of the Drift. In 2018, Nina was one of three winners of the Women Poets Prize, and in 2019, won the inaugural Nan Shepherd Prize for Nature Writing and the Landfall Essay Competition. She runs Bitter Melon, a small press that publishes limited edition pamphlets by Asian diaspora poets. And today we're going to hear from Nina's forward prize shortlisted debut collection, Magnolia Moulin, published by Nine Arches Press. Uh, Magnolia Moulin has been described by Mary Jean Chan as being like a gorgeous love letter to Shanghai. For me, the collection has been a revelation, not least through the ex exploration of the maps that we create of ourselves uh, and our memories, whether about language or memoir or nature and sharing food. These poems are described in bold colour, in rain, through light, and with the richness and possibilities of language. And Nina, we'd be delighted if you could share a few poems with us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Becky, uh, for your words. That was amazing. I'm 
my heart's racing <laughs> such lovely words about my book um it's amazing to read with you will and romelin as well uh so i'll begin last eclipse she traveled alone she crossed the mountains she watched the landscape innocently she supported her head on her fist. She felt strange birds in the trees. She touched an avalanche. She moved towards it. She waited without air. She sweated into the cold. She became volcanic. She heard the moon unhook from her teeth. She felt a piece of sun detach. She dissolved with blue light into orchards. She became a color never seen. She flooded all the valleys. She sensed the last sane moment approaching. This poem uh, is a New Zealand poem, so a lot of the book is um, written from and to Shanghai, where I lived for a while, but also many of the poems are about Wellington, where I was born. And this one, um, I wrote it after listening to the radio through the night after there had been quite a big earthquake in New Zealand in 2016, and I was far away in China listening to the radio, and this is what came out of that. The first wave, 14 November 2016. They request that we inform you immediately. You are standing on soft ground. The ceiling lights are swinging in the background. The waves crash, then dissipate. The first wave may not be the largest. This is a flow on event, so do not go near. Do not stay and watch the land slipping. It has triggered other faults like a network of nerves and the seabed has risen out of the sea. There are visible ruptures running along the landscape. This is a flow on event, but the moon does not cause earthquakes. The ceiling lights are a typical pattern of aftershocks and they request that we inform you you are a visible rapture running along the landscape. Do not stay and watch your nerves slipping. There will be strong currents in the background. The moon has risen out of the sea. The first wave crashes, then dissipates. You are standing on such soft ground. Princess Mononoke plants spring bulbs. Last night, a slow quake ripped skin fissures in her tilled earth. Where wild mint grew, she digs into the split, places iris, hyacinth, allium into narrow beds of soil and ash, waits for their silently wintering hearts to burst. Iris, Iris, Hyacinth, Allium. Her low-mied wolf flowers, her feral cinder blooms. Their names repeat inside her like an incantation. This one is my only sonnet I've ever written. Sonnet with particles of gold. Today, scientists discovered the origins of gold, the sound of egg noodles crisping up in the wok, the garden carpeted in kofi petals, the way my phone corrects Romati summer to rainstorm. The day after my grandmother died was white gold in colour, 
A star explodes and wings are found among the debris, along with pieces of a character I never memorized, our only name for her, poor, a woman beneath a wave. Drift, she mouths softly in English. What is drift? My mother translates into her language, not one of mine. I try to make myself remember by writing poor over and over on squares of paper covering the walls. So I'm surrounded by the women and the water radicals they hold close. The tips of waves touch me in my sleep. I'll finish now with the very first poem in the book. Girl Warrior, or Watching Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles. One. I remember the sound the sword made when she cut off all her hair. A sound like my mother cutting fabric. Those blue scissors clutched in her small hands. I remember wondering why she didn't cut from the roots. A Disney princess kneeling in the smoke colored dark with straight hair, thin waist, hardly any breasts. Unlike me with my thick legs and too much hair that doesn't stay. Why don't we cut it short, she said. And so we did, but soon it curled sideways ungracefully caught in the wind of some perpetual hurricane. Two. When I watch Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles, I understand only some of the words. So my focus shifts to certain details. How Mulan drags a very large cannon across the snow with very small wrists. How the villain has skin as dark as coal and such small eyes, he has no irises. Once a guy told me mixed girls are the most beautiful because they aren't really white, but they aren't really Asian either. Three. After Mulan saves China, fireworks rain down in waves of multicolored stars. You fight pretty good, says her boyfriend with the big American arms. I have small victories too, being kind to my body for one day, not checking my phone for your texts, walking home at night alone and not feeling lonely. Four, why don't you ever write about yourself? I didn't know why either. In Chinese, one word can lead you out of the dark, then back into it in a single breath. Shut off the light, as my mother and many other Chinese mothers say. Now, open it. Five. When Milan returns home, the colors change from gray, blue, green to pink, warm, yellow. There are plum blossoms floating in the stream. Her hair is still a little messy to make sure we don't forget she used to be something else. Six. When summer ended, rain poured off the edge of elevated highways and washed away the moon. I no longer have a sword, but sometimes at night I hold my keys between my fingers. I paint my lips. I draw avalanches. I light fires inside dream palaces. I cut my hair over the bathroom sink. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. What a lovely reading. I've got goosebumps reading, uh, listening to you. Um, that line about I touched an avalanche has stayed with me since I read the book. Um, mm. And nature features often in your poetry. But I wanted to ask you about um, the title of your poem, uh, your collection first, um, Magnolia Mulan. Um, how did you rest on that title and what's the significance? It took me a long time. Um, this book uh, was titleless for a long time. And then I had a much longer title, which actually was sort of the title of the final poem in the book, um, Magnolia Jade Orchid, She Wolf. 
and um but uh my lovely lovely editors um encouraged me to maybe go for a shorter title and i was happy to do that but i wanted it to be a kind of a, a more complicated uh than just i could have gone for the word magnolia but i i did want to have um the chinese characters there so these are the traditional chinese characters um mulan um which means magnolia in mandarin and also is the name of the famous mythical um warrior princess so um and it's also the official flower i believe of the city of shanghai so it was kind of a natural in the end it, i realized it was the natural title and magnolia is another color you have a sonnet um with gold um that sounded as though it was in honor of your grandmother and there are other poems in the collection one uh around color fragments and the first line again is one that stayed with me on on your way home from the botanical garden we dreamt of building a museum of all the colors of the world um you make it sound like it's actually a possibility to make a museum of all the colors of the world um and i wanted to ask about the significance of color throughout um your poems too yeah i mean um i don't i think it is possible but in ways that maybe we are still imagining or have not imagined yet to make that museum of color maybe that's like what i'm always trying to do in my poems because i'm obsessed with colors um and i always have been but i but i only recently in the last maybe few years started to write about a lot of color um I love the challenge of finding new words for new colors and um I think because a lot of the book is also about the complexity of nostalgia and for me um thinking of far away places or distant memories the colors always change or become more intense and so that's a feeling that I I'm always interested in trying to capture in poetry mm. I think Mm. And there's a sense, particularly in the second and third sections of the collection, that you're retracing a path to a language that you've lost. You talked about the language of nostalgia and relearning mm. Mandarin and how to speak that language. Um, the first line of field notes on a downpour struck me. Um, the first character of my mother's name, Wen, is made of rain and language. Um, mm. And so many of the poems shift between languages on the page. Can you say a bit more about about that shift between languages? Yeah, absolutely. Um that was something that I I started doing early on kind of using Chinese characters in my poems. But I wasn't sure, you know, if it was really okay to do that, but I just kind of did it anyway. <laughs> but then it was it was when I moved here to the UK um almost 3 years ago. That I discovered poets like um Mary Jean Chan, Jennifer Wong, Sarah Howe, who are all doing really interesting things with language. And um Mary Jean especially has spoken before about the decision not to, for example, not to italicize or not to mm. um provide glossaries. I think there is a place sometimes for glossaries, but I'm really interested in poetry of um getting rid of that stuff <laughs> and um just um presenting language on the page as it is for me in my reality and so that means imperfect pieces of chinese because my chinese is at the moment useless um and so i'm interested in in like in that in that imperfection um because lots of us have different relationships to language romelin as well um uses language so interestingly in her poems on the page. Mm. Thank you very much. And is there I mean if if there's a question from the audience um do have a look if not I have I've another for you. Um I don't think there is. No? So uh, just before we, we we move on to the next reading can you tell us about um a current project that you're excited about and how we can find out more of that? Um sure. That's a great question. Well, at the moment I'm um 
finishing a book of essays, um, which will be coming out next summer with Canongate Books. And um, it's, it's quite exciting uh, to have been given this permission to uh, write in this longer form, but which I also treat very much like a poetic form, uh, which maybe frustrates my editor sometimes, but um, is really interesting. So it's a book of um, nature writing uh, in the form of personal essays. And um, yeah, it will be out next summer. <laughs> Great. Um, and, and we look forward to it. And I know the Manchester Literature Festival and the Poetry Library um, will look forward to welcoming you again. But stay with us for the for the reading. Um, and thank you very much. Um, you much. And it, it's always very strange when you can't hear applause from an audience. But I can see from the from the comments um, that it was a really gorgeous, beautiful reading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. And I, I will just move to Will, who uh, is a writer of Chinese, Indonesian and British heritage, born and based uh, in London, North London, uh, somewhere I know well. Um, he's worked in schools, led workshops at the South Bank Centre and teaches for the Poetry School. He is the contributing editor at the Rialto and a fellow of the Complete Works 3. Uh, his poem, Say, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for the Best Single Poem in 2018, and he received a Poetry Fellowship for the Arts Foundation in 2019. His first collection, uh, Rendang, published in the UK by Granter, is a Poetry Book Society choice and shortlisted for both the Forward Prize for Best Collection and the T.S. Eliot Prize. Rendang uh, has been an irresistible collection to get to know Will and poems that have taken me on every step of their journey. Um, I know the collection has been described by Raymond Antrobus as a dissection of and a love letter the to the histories and places and things that make us. Um, they give so much in terms of an exploration of the self. And as I'm sure you'll appreciate from Will's reading, the poems have the capacity to literally stop you in your tracks you just have to take a moment to breathe. Um, so, Will, I'd like to hand over to you to, to read for us. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Becky, for that introduction. Be generous. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I need to project. Uh, <laughs> it, always, it always takes a little moment to adjust to uh, reading into my computer, but it's really nice to be here um, in spirit. Well, I mean, and in some sense, physically, with Nina and Romelin, two poets I really love, and, and whose work I also really love, and to be here with all of you, thank you so much. Um, it's also really nice, this is live. The last couple of things I've done like this have been pre-recorded, but at least this has a kind of live free song. I could spill water on my laptop at any point. I could say something stupid that would be that we couldn't edit out. Anyway, I thought I'd start with a poem that I thought of while Nina was reading, um, her beautiful poem about flowers and incantation. And this is a poem which I kind of wrote for myself as a little kind of spell or incantation to kind of ward away sadness or, yeah, or loneliness generally. Budlier, not Buddha, chanting in bloom. My soul before I knowed it, chanting too. I ran down to the tube and from Gray's Inn Road to Farringdon to the Golden Lane Estate. Budlier, not Buddha, chanting in bloom. I went not caring where I went, how late it was or why, but barred at every turn I took and every church gate chained. Budlier, not Buddha, chanting in bloom. Grey it grew and far from home until I had to stop. My bundling found me on a bus and eyes closed there I cried, waiting for the sky to gape and let me crawl inside. Budlier, not Buddha, chanting in bloom. Budlier, not Buddha, buddling on my tomb. Um, 
And then I thought I'd read a section from uh, this long poem called The White Jumper, which I guess I kind of think of as a kind of journal I kept during a few months, a couple of years ago, when I was kind of, it was kind of like a cross between a dream journal and a kind of reading journal, and a, where I kind of tried to let whatever I was experiencing enter the poem. Um, I don't know how much time is. I've probably been re talking for like three minutes. Okay. Just gonna make, I don't want to overrun. Um, and then during this same period, my grandma, um, Chandra Sari, or Matt, as I called her, she passed away. And so that kind of became part of the poem. And I guess the thing linking it together was this dream I had about a white jumper. So like images of whiteness and different forms come into it as they kind of do when you think of something and you just start seeing it everywhere. So I'm going to read this section in particular about my grandma. Um, I asked my grandma questions, my mum translating. I asked if she was scared. Of what? The coup? No, she was brave. In Sumatra once, having paid our respects at the tomb of her husband, we drove into the jungle. Everywhere was green. We stopped by a store and the driver left us to buy water. Men walked out from behind a pickup truck. She gripped the overhead handle. Their machetes gleamed. She gripped the overhead handle. Everywhere was green. In the last weeks, bedbound, her hair grew out. Black strands, white at the roots. Later, they lay her in a white frilled coffin in a marble room and marked the 40 days of mourning wearing only white. Lid and lip are little words, little things too. The short eye associated with lightness and pith. The pith of my system, said Coleridge, is to make the senses out of the mind, not the mind out of the senses, the mind's white rind, not the white rind's mind. I want to call her closed lids buds, because shut they look like petals tucked away which could at any moment bud. At her wake she asked for pearls to be placed inside her nostrils and between her lips and on, her, and on her lids to light her to the afterlife and stop her eyes from growing in this world again. In April, children chased each other around the garden. I thought of the white jumper and the black hood worn by hangmen to hide the world and keep its wearer hidden, to denote sin and keep it out. Um, it's weird, I haven't had very long. Uh, this is a short reading, and yet I'm still managed to completely lose track of time. Um, there's going to be one more poem, but actually, if, if I had longer, I kind of, I kind of wanted to read a poem by this poet I've been obsessed with recently called Ito Hiromi. Um, so I'm just going to recommend this book. It's a little book recommendation, Ito Hiromi. These are, uh, this is an early collection of hers. Kilan Kanoko, and a kind of later one, which was her return to poetry in the 2000s. She wrote prose for a while called Wild Grass on the Riverbank. And they're both like masterpieces. They're both two of the best books I've ever read. So I recommend it. <clears throat> um, published by Tilted Axis. And this is, okay, it's the final one, final part a kind of poem about living in London. Half Got Out. I was reading a poem by Ben Johnson where a newborn, half got out, 
sees the city burning and decides to crawl back into his mother's womb, thine urn, he calls it. It was Tuesday morning. I'd just seen Leo near Leicester Square. He was reading a book by W.S. Merwin, a poet himself newly returned to his dead mother's womb. I was feeling so anxious, Leo said, kind of low. When I started to read him, it felt like I found him at just the right time. I'm not sure. But don't parents always talk about their kids arriving at just the right time, like you might describe finding your flip-flops just before a beach holiday? Yes, I said to Leo. He wrote that poem, didn't he? The sad dad one that starts, my friend says I was not a good son, you understand? I say yes, I understand. He says, I did not go to see my parents very often, you know, and I say yes, I know. I love the way the dialogue loops back in on itself, the way you know the poet is really talking to or about themselves. It hurts to read it. It reminds me I could be seeing my parents right now who live 10 stops away, yes, half an hour, but I'm not, and what else am I not doing? You have to work though, you have to make a living, don't you? That may be true, I don't know. I left the library in light rain to meet Sophie for a drink at the Chandos, and she told me her granddad used to go to Richmond Park to fish. He was a wireless operating sergeant during the war. It's not like she cares, it's just funny, you know. Even if she had a Victoria Cross taped to her forehead, it wouldn't stop those dickheads at the bar from asking if she's Latina or something. I just fucking hate this city, you understand? I say yes, I understand. But I don't know how to leave it. I say, yes, I know. I mean, sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to leave or where I'd even go. I looped back to enter the tube at Leicester Square, stepping over the body of a homeless man to travel further again from my mother's womb to Turnpike Lane. The word interred echoing in my head. How many acres of earth were there above me then? The whole city might have been burning. I could already have been dead. There's no going back, my dad said. But how many times have I crossed the point of no return, only to crawl back down King Street or Goldhawk Road to eat chicken noodle soup and talk about seat cushions from Lidl? Yes, they're good value. Thank you for dinner. Thank you. Half got out and half in wound. I know that's just the way it is. I understand the tube threading me like a complex stitch beneath and through the city, back to the house we've been sharing lately. When I got in, I said, I'm home. And you said, yes, I know. And then you filled the kettle and sat down next to me and said, thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, I love that that poem finishes on what is not said. Um, I yeah. wonder if you could tell us a little more about your first poem, The, the, the Spell. Um, Oh, yeah. You said a kind of spell to sadness and loneliness, Badlia, not Buddha. Um, mm. Can you tell us a bit more about that poem? Mm. It was actually in a different form for a while. And I think in that form, it was maybe more explicitly a spell. In fact, since I'm on my computer, maybe I could even find <laughs> um, I don't know how. We... No, I, I'm not going to look it up. But it was. It was basically, the, yeah, okay, one line in the original draft was about kind of making peace with what I haven't done and will not do, you know, I haven't done and will probably never do. And, kind mm -hmm. of, and a kind of, I guess, yeah, like a kind of prayer of acceptance, acceptance of failure, acceptance of, or, yeah, of in action and then it so then it then i kind of whistled it down and made it more kind of rhyme and hymn like but i guess yeah the, the sorry the original impetus for that poem came from just repeating the word buddlier in my head and you know one of those days where you kind of don't do anything you don't feel like you've achieved anything and i researched the history of buddlier and i thought it had my i i I kind of imagined as I was saying it that it had some link to Buddha, but of course it didn't. So I wrote this poem about how it doesn't have a link. And then it ends with that line about accepting, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. and then I tried to rewrite it, which is the version in Rendon, in a way where I hoped it would convey that feeling of kind of accepting, you know, things being as they are. Yeah. 
that's it. <laughs> that's quite a convoluted description, but that was kind of the process behind it. And the name um, Rendang, the first the first part of the book is um, a kind of page of, of a wall of capitals looking at that word Rendang, mm. Render. Um, why did you uh, decide on that wall of words to begin with and, and uh, uh, the first thing you see? Um, there's this quote uh, about poetry, which I really love, which I feel like I kind of have started saying too much that I'm going to become one of those people who just say repeat the same thing all the time. But uh, it's from Wittgenstein, but I know it via Veronica Forrest Thompson, who's a poet critic um, from the 70s. And it's that the, the poetry it uses the language of information, but is not, in, is not employed in the language game of giving information. And when I see, so it's, you know, it's a concrete poem. When I see that, I see words, which individually would mean something. You know, mm. words which might be used to convey information, but arranged in such a way that they're not conveying information. And I feel like, for me, one thing it's doing is setting you up into the kind of receptive mode in which you can you can get the most out of poetry, out of a poem. Mm. You're not expecting information to be conveyed in a kind of linear way, in mm. which anything you're expecting to misunderstand and misconstrue and misread what follows and obviously yeah there are, there's also there are like a kind of a lot of different ways i could talk about it we don't have that long <laughs> well no that makes sense and i've been meaning to ask you a question for a while about mm. um you mentioned that poetry matters to me uh, it's never just about self-expression it expresses our embeddedness in each other our embeddedness in each other and when you just did your reading i thought about threaded through a family and your grandmother. Um, and I wonder what about that, if you can tell me more about that phrase. I mean, in a way, is that what started you reading and writing poetry? Something about connection? Yeah, I think so. Now when I think of that phrase, I think um, <laughs> when someone someone posted that article on, um, on Twitter using that as the kind of pull quote and someone underneath, just wrote, that's meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're kind of right. I mean, that statement is meaningless, as in to say poetry expresses our embeddedness. And, you know, it's like an abstract sentiment. It only has meaning. <laughs> like, it, it's only, like, filled by your own individual specific engagement with poetry. Hmm. I, like, I wasn't trying to, like, express, like, general truth about poetry. I think for me, I realised that Poems meant something once I started sharing them with people, and yeah, well, and started meeting other poets and and realizing that well, I guess for me, like the things like the address is important. Like, so I'd writing poems to people, and which were kind of foregrounding relationships rather, rather than seeing them as forms of oh, well, like I said, like as self-expression. You know, trying to like rummage through my like personal chest of anecdotes think about things I needed to say which I, I mm. always found really difficult once I just mm. thought of them as like actually ways of talking to people or letting other people speak or relationships speak and that mm. when they started to mean something to me when they were less me based mm -hmm. um, but I think that statement will hopefully mean different things for different people mm -hmm. <laughs> if yes, the things we are connected to. Mm. Mm. But um, it is also a meaningless statement, which is maybe fine. <laughs> which is which is fine. It's an abstract statement, so it's mm. you know, it's not a an action an action statement. Mm. No, I appreciate your thoughts on that, and uh, very wise too. Um, and I just want to thank you for a beautiful reading. Um, very very moving. Lots lots of. Um, thoughts from people watching uh, and I think you know we again the Literature Festival and the Poetry Library we look forward to welcoming you back to Manchester for, for hopefully for longer conversations. It will be lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks Becky, thank you. And Romelin, um, to our final reading, um, Romelin grew up in the Philippines uh, until she migrated 
to the UK when she was 16 years old. She is a West Midlands based poet, co-founding editor of Harana Poetry, and Romelin took part in the Jerwood Arvon Mentoring Programme in 2017, which is where I met you, Romelin. Um, she won the Manchester Poetry Prize in 2017, as well as the Poetry London Prize in 2018. And her debut pamphlet, Rice and Rain, received the 2018 Saboteur Award for Best Poetry Pamphlet. Apart from being a writer, Romelin also works full time as a specialist nurse practitioner. Uh, Romelin's debut collection, The Anti Emetic for Home Sickness, is published by Chateau and Windus. Um, her poems are captivating. Um, as I've been living with this collection over the summer, uh, I've been astonished, uh, Romelin, by their lightness. Um, whilst you're exploring stories of migration, of loss, um, that bridge a new life in the UK uh, with empathy and love. And the language of Filipino folklore runs through the work with poems peppered with the language of Tagalog. Um, this is a poet who pays attention to the emotions and feelings of others around her. And I'm delighted, Romelin, that you've joined us for our final reading this afternoon. Um, do go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that's a very, very uh, heartwarming introduction. So thank you very much. And thank you, Manchester Lit Fest, for having me. Thanks, Nina. Thank you, Will. And congratulations with all your successes. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read is called Names. As Becky said, I grew up in the Philippines. I grew up in the Philippines with an absentee mother. My mother left when I was a child to work abroad as a nurse. As the saying goes, all Filipinos are nurses. <laughs> but really, she left in order to provide a better chance in life for us. And I guess this poem is my attempt to explore what it means to be exiled through employment, and not only physically, but also emotionally, and what it means to find a sense of belonging and a sense of knowing in the names that are given to us. Names. We are nameless and all names are ours. Emmanuel Lacaba. My mother's name is Rosana, but when she left, I had other mothers, Rowena, Jimboy, Alma. I was named after the first syllables of my parents. I will always have them with me. My mother says not all names have meaning. Riverside, Manila, London, Corba. And someday I will forget all the commands I did not heed, like the time I did not spin the plate clockwise before my father left for work, even if it would deliver him from accidents. Not all destinations are found in the junctions of your palm lines. Say better life, say better life. And God knows I am repenting. Say Airbus something, say one-way ticket, keep following the sunset. Clouds are the closest things to my mother. Say United Kingdom, say the Queen, NHS, does winter always mean? Listen, can you hear it? The loneliness of stretchers along a &E corridors. And the strongest part of me is the scar I hide underneath my French. My mother hides in the staff toilet to make long distance calls. Someday I will realize the woman lonely in her mansion is not my mother, but a future version of myself. I will chop bitter guards on the galaxy glimmer of her worktop. Shall we shorten your name on your name tag so it's easier to remember? Say, yes, please, sister. Say, please, sister, can I take this call? Say, Marco, Harold, Arnold. Say, septicemia, alcohol poisoning, hernia, say Jason, Darius, Vernon, say cancer, myocardial infarction, query, schizophrenia, hides in the toilet. And I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. 
A boy sticks out his tongue and says, I do not have a mother. I punch him in the face, the sanctity of blood. I am not scared. Because my mother has followed the sunset. Because she has burnt her lips on mash and gravy in a three-minute lunch break. Because she calls me Anak, my child, my baby. She asks, what do you want for Christmas, for your birthday? 1990 remains stuck on the other line. Say, please, sister, can I take this call? My breasts blossom. She can call me only by my name. I have the first syllables of my parents' names. That is why I am not scared. I can track the mountain of Makulot, my father's rifle hanging from my back. I can carry myself, not how someone carries a side to toxic drug, but how my mother hooks with her finger, a drained bottle with blood clots, the weight of gemstones. Overseas Filipino workers like my mother spend a fraction of their monthly wage on little gifts to put inside a balik buying box. Um, once full, they send that box to the Philippines, to their families back home, to remind them that even though I'm away, I'm still here and I can still um, remember you and here's a gift for you. The next poem that I'm going to read is called Notes Inside a Balik Bayan Box. I remember myself standing by the door waiting for my mother's Balik Bayan Box. And I remember my brother opening the box and looking at the gifts. And his face was enlightening or lightening up as if, as if those material things were enough to, to replace our mother. So this poem is my attempt to explore what is passed down to us through language, language that is noted, language that is said, and language that remains unuttered. Notes inside a balik bayan box. Dear son, in my place, here is a balik bayan box. Here are the Lebron James rubber shoes size nine and the video game tapes to replace all the palm cakes I owe you for every Simbangabi and PTA meeting I could not attend. I promise I'll be there for Christmas. I know I've been saying this for a decade now. Find the E45 cream for your grandma's tissue dry skin, a stack of incontinence pads and tubes of barrier balm. Between you and me, Every time I roll old people onto their sides and lift their knees to their chest for suppositories, I ask myself, who does this for her? Tell Tita to leave her husband, her school sweetheart, whose mistresses are Majong and Sabong. Tell her not to bear the stink of his armpits. In the box, find the Gucci Bloom perfume and scar creams. Tell her I haven't forgotten our vows when we were young and our fingers smelled of lihing mui candies, our walang iwanan oath to never leave each other. Dear son, in my place, here is a balik bayan box. Rip all the packaging tape. Every gift inside is yours. Work your hands hard until there's nothing left. Learn that to survive, we must have strong arms to carry a tray full of medicine and not let one drop, to push a hyperventilating woman with speed and care to the maternity wing, to lift and sit a skin and bone man down on his chemo chair, to gauge the weight of a rose before you lay it onto a coffin. Take this box inside our house that is all I ask you to carry for now, my son. When I was young, my mother used to tell me about her stories of her adventures abroad, how she met other overseas Filipino workers. And um, 
sometimes she would even see them at airports, whether they are going there in other countries or coming back home to the Philippines. And what they do is while they're sharing their stories, they would share food from the countries they've been in. The next poem that I'm going to read is called Group Portrait at the Stopover. When I went back to the Philippines back in 2017, while I was writing this book, I was at the Dubai airport, which was the last stop before the Philippines. And I, and I look around me and I thought, oh my God, there's so many Filipinos who are going home, still so many overseas Filipino workers. And it filled me with such joy, but also such sadness at the same time. Joy because, because I realized that even after so many years, Filipinos is still choose to leave in order to rebuild and build the life that they want for their loved ones. So there's such an honor in that, but also sadness because after so many years, the Philippines and I'm sure many other countries continue to let their people down. They cannot provide economic security after all those years. This is my last poem. Thank you again, Manchester Lit Fest, and thank you everyone. But you must forgive me because um, I told a lie. Not all Filipinos are nurses. Um, we have so many other professions and workers all around the world. So we have nannies, housemaid in Hong Kong, Middle East. My auntie and my uncles, um, they're nannies and cleaners in Italy. Uh, we have so many seamen floating about the world. And when I said seamen, I mean seafarers. Um, my, my brother, he is a seafarer. He, he just went back to the Philippines two or three weeks ago. So he, he went back to his family there after a year of sailing in an American tanker. So yeah, I meant seafarer. Group portrait at the step over. Take a walk over the sharp stones, then come back. Pablo Neruda. One. Elbow to elbow on waiting chairs. We rummage through our luggage for threshers and out flit our sunbirds. I lift the 24 carat radiance of butter fudge. Take this, sigina and I will accept your focaccia and basbuza. Two, Manong, tell me your story until the whole terminal smells of petrol and rust. Salt-soaked tanker, the skyscraper tide that almost sunk your ship is now the wind beating the viewing glass. Remember the afternoons that could burn a dragonfly the oil stickiness of your wife's lips, and the baby you let one night, who, by the morning of your return, had turned into a man with a beard. Three. Manang, you keep glancing at me. For a moment, I thought the burn mark on your cheek was a spotted moth wing. I am listening. Whisper of the days you must dab garlic on your wrist, smear grease on your neck, so sir won't grab. Speak of the years you spent sleeping on floors beside potatoes and pickle jars, and the day you learned how to arrange flowers for visitors, fill the vases with faithful water, admire the petals whose edges are like so teeth. Four, Manong, Manang, take this, and I will tell you how I pull out with five colleagues a bariatric man from the driver's seat and start chest compressions in the hospital car park. I will take you there. Between rushing to a and &E and the doctor yelling, jump on him. Jump there with me. On top of the stretcher, the man between your legs, your hands pumping his heart. Do not fear the clatter of wheels, the bumps and slopes in corridors. It is only turbulence. Five. 
let these duty-free bags distract our loved ones from the scars on our feet. Tara na, let's not think for now of the next generation that will meet at this gate the same old stories that will hum out of younger mouths. Let's go home to our elders' kitchens where tapioca pearls soften in the choir of casseroles. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. That was an absolutely beautiful reading. Um, that last line is a favorite of mine in terms of um, your respect for your elders. Let's go home to our elders' kitchens where tapioca pearls soften in the choir of casseroles. And thank you for reading an, an extra poem. We have a little time for questions. Um, we have one from Paula. Um, and she says, you came to the UK at 16, um, trained to be a nurse like your mother. Um, she says she was very impressed knowing that you write in a second language. And is there any advice that you would give um, to somebody with a, a kind of non-literary role or background uh, who wants to be a writer at the same time? I think that's a very important question. Thank you for asking that. Um, to be honest, when I was when I started writing, I, I did dream of being able to um, finance myself in order to write to to, to get a creative writing course or um, a degree in this, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I turned out to be a nurse. And the reason being mainly is because I had to make a choice. Growing up in the Philippines, I knew how hard it was to, to, to not have anything. It's not that we were really, really poor, but we, right. were, you know, we were getting all the basic needs in life, but we cannot find security if we're ill then we have to we have to get some money from somewhere so i grew up believing that i have to be a nurse because that's the only that's the only profession that would give me a sense of security and mm -hmm. for years i would look at other people um having creative writing degrees or masters in this or doctorate in that and i and i would always say to myself oh it's um how come I can't afford this? But what I realize is that having or coming from a different background, from a non-literary background, like you said, has been has been a gift to me. Um, in order for you to get a nurse, you have to study a Bachelor of Science in of nursing. But the mm -hmm. truth is nursing, and I'm sure other professions as well, can be a Bachelor of Arts. Because in nursing, we are taught to pay attention, pay attention on a word, on a patient, on the color of the pills. You know, you give a nurse a bottle of like white liquid, which when she shakes it, she'll know if it's a normal saline or a morphine sulfate. And as mm -hmm. poets, isn't that what we do? Anyway, mm -hmm. pay attention. And I think that coming from a non-literary background is good because it will give you a different view of the word. Um, as long as you are improving yourself, you're improving your writing, that should lead you to where to where you should be. And I think that's the most important thing. It doesn't uh, obviously it's 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 really hard because poetry you also have to craft things mm -hmm. and you also have to learn certain things. But it really doesn't matter where you come from. Thank you. And I'm afraid we're out of time for more questions, but um, any more that have come in. Um, hopefully, Romlin, we can welcome you back to Manchester in future. Thank um, you. I'd just like to bring all of our poets back just to, for a final thanks. Um, thank you again, Nina and Will and Romlin. Just the most fantastic reading. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, just a reminder that you can buy the books that we've mentioned on the Manchester Literature Festival website. And the wonderful thing about doing something live on Crowdcast for the Literature Festival is that you can listen to this um, for another 72 hours. So if you want to hear Nina and Will and Romelin's readings again, just like reading a good poem over and over again, you have a chance to do that over the next three days. Um, and thanks again, it's, this is the, only the second day of the Manchester Lit Fest Festival. And I hope that you'll join us 
for other events over the weekend. Um, there is a, a quote at the beginning of Rommel in your book, um, the epigraph to your collection is a Rilke quote. Um, Love your solitude, accept the pain it causes you, and make a melody with it. Uh, and it seemed fitting to me at a time when we're all uh, spending more time alone, that these poems have been so heartwarming this afternoon. And thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the festival in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.